This is a courtesy announcement that the meeting is now live on the meeting portal and YouTube.
Microphone, please. All right, start over, over again. Good evening, my name is Bob Levy, Chair of the Planning Commission, and I'd like to welcome you all to the meeting of July 27th. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Peggy back. It's good to see you, Peggy. Nice to be here. All right, and I'm gonna give you the first uh, job here. Uh, roll call, Commissioner Belska. Present. Commissioner Rouser. Present. Commissioner Moore. Here. Commissioner Escobar. Here. Vice Chairperson O'Donohue. Here. Chairperson Levy. Present. You have a quorum. Great, thank you. And if you can all stand, well, first of all, if you could all turn off your phones. I know mine will be the first one to ring. And now we can do the Pledge of Allegiance. The next item on the agenda is the consent calendar. Uh, Apologies for the interruption. We are at public comment. Oh, public comments. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, this is the opportunity for anybody to uh, address the commission on items that are not on the agenda. Uh, if there's, I, and the, the commission cannot take action on any items that are not on the agenda. But if you'd like to address the commission with a, an informational, something informational or a question, uh, this is your time. You will have three minutes to speak. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak? Peggy, is there anybody online? We have no live or virtual speakers this evening. We have no speakers? No. Great, okay. Then uh, we'll close public uh, comment. And now on to the consent calendar. Uh, we have on the consent calendar a couple of minutes. I understand that we may have a motion here. Or a, a yeah, I'd like to request. just uh, suggest a change. Um, a little bit of a wording oh, on, on them. On. Why pull, do, you, do you want to pull something from consent? I, I just want to make a change and then I can make a motion with, with an amendment that we okay. accept the consent we'll calendar. Yeah. Um, I, spoke briefly with uh, Peggy what's your t title again clerk the clerk, clerk. <laughs> and uh, and she had some suggested wording to change on one of the items and um, the the other was the on number 15 the minutes both 15 and 16 referred to amended minutes, but only 16 was amended. So I'd like to just strike the word amended out of 15 and just say these were the, the minutes, approved minutes. And then I have the revised language. This is for item number 16. It's the April minutes. Item number six of the minutes, packet page 1482, second paragraph, will read, Chairperson Levy reconvene the meeting at 7.58 p.m. with Commissioners Moore, Rouser, Belska, and Escobar present, and Vice Chairperson O'Donohue recused, and revisited the item after item number nine was considered. All right. So with that, I make a motion we approve the consent calendar. All right. We approve the consent calendar as amended. Uh, do we have a second? Second. All right, any discussion on the motion? No discussion, then if we have a roll call, a roll call vote, I assume? Um, yes, and we have no virtual or live speakers. Uh, Commissioner Belska. Approve. Commissioner Rouser. Approve. Commissioner Moore. Approve. Commissioner Escobar. Approve. Vice Chairperson O'Donohue. Approve. Uh, Chairperson Levy. Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our onto our regular agenda is item five, the training session on the Plan Bay Area. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Levy. We have with us today Chirag Rabari. From, he's representing the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, an association of Bay Area governments, better known as uh, MTC and ABAG, and uh, he will do a presentation this evening on Plan Bay Area. Uh, good evening, uh, commission members. Um, and I do have a, a slide deck that I'm sharing at the moment. 
And I'll just uh, remind Chirag that you will have to be very close to the microphone on, on that location. Okay. Um, so, so yes, uh, Chirag Rabari with the, the um, MTC ABAG Regional Planning Program. Um, Sorry, let me double check one more time. There we go, much better. Right. So I am here to present an overview of Plan Bay Area 2050, which is the current long range plan for the nine county San Francisco Bay Area focused on the future of transportation, housing, the economy, and the environment. This plan was unanimously adopted by MTC and ABAG, the two regional agencies charged with long-range planning for the region in October of 2021. And I'll also present a brief overview of Plan Bay Area 2050 Plus, which is the update to the regional plan, which just kicked off this month. So Plan Bay Area 2050 built on four years worth of work. It began with the Horizon Initiative, which was a nearly two-year-long precursor effort that focused on understanding how strategies and investments would fare in an uncertain future. This included analysis of three divergent futures to understand the impacts of external economic, technological, environmental, and political forces on the region's future, and laid the groundwork for a plan with investments and strategies that have been stress-tested to succeed in multiple visions of the region's future. In 2020, work began in earnest on Plan Bay Area 2050 through the blueprint phase. Through multiple rounds of analysis and engagement, staff iterated through initial draft set of strategy recommendations, or the draft blueprint, and refined those strategies through a second phase, the final blueprint, finally arriving at the ultimate set of recommendations, including in Plan Bay Area 2050, as well as its accompanying environmental analysis report. Plan Bay Area 2050 represented a number of firsts for the region. It represented a key pivot from trying to predict the future to embracing uncertainty when planning for the future. It was guided by the MTC ABAG equity platform, with equity emphasized to a degree that surpasses prior long-range planning efforts. It included innovative public engagement efforts ranging from online games to pop-up outreach, it was also the first long-range plan produced after the MTC and ABAG staff unification. And the plan also was the first to take, take a look at what it would take to actually address the region's long-running affordable housing challenges. It also met aggress aggressive climate emission reduction targets passed by the state and included an initial foray into planning for sea level rise adaptation at a regional scale. Plan Bay Area 2050 at its core was driven by years of public input. To highlight a few statistics, this included over 290 public and stakeholder engagement events, over 234,000 comments received, over 23,000 participants engaged over the four-year planning process. We used a diverse set of engagement tactics both before and during the pandemic, put a greater emphasis on reaching out to lower income communities and communities of color, and targeted an audience as diverse as the Bay Area really is. This feedback helped us uh, craft Plan Bay Area 2050, comprised of 35 equitable and resilient strategies that align with the adopted Plan Bay Area 2050 vision to ensure that by the year 2050, the Bay Area is affordable, connected, diverse, healthy, and vibrant for all. Spanning to transportation strategies, housing strategies and geographies for future housing growth, economic strategies and geographies for future job growth, and environmental strategies, Plan Bay Area 2050 represents a more comprehensive vision for the future than pre uh, previous planning efforts. And ultimately, just like the puzzle pieces on the screen, the strategies of Plan Bay Area 2050 are a package designed to achieve synergy, synergies amongst each other. The onset of the pandemic in the midst of the planning process for Plan Bay Area 2050 shaped the strategies and analysis included in the plan. While the preceding Horizon Initiative did not explicitly consider a pandemic, it did consider the impacts of several external forces that were relevant to the pandemic era, such as higher rates of telecommuting, an economic recession, and decreased preferences for shared transportation modes. In particular, we updated the planning assumptions used in our analysis to reflect slower short-term growth in population jobs and revenues available from sources like sales taxes. We updated our str strategies and added new ones to respond to new challenges from the pandemic. 
For example, the economy element emphasized financial support to help more families connect to high-speed internet, which was crucial to maintain connectivity during the pandemic. We also updated projections on telecommuting, assuming a higher share of war people would work from home on a given weekday, even after the pandemic had subsided. Finally, the pandemic validated a key assumption that planning for unpredictable future events is a necessary exercise and resulted in further efforts being dedicated to preparing for other future unknowns like wildfire and earthquakes. The 35 strategies are clustered into 11 key themes. Transportation strategies focus on maintaining and optimizing the existing system through pricing and fare reforms, creating healthy and safe streets through 10,000 miles of new bike lanes and off-street paths, and building a next generation transit network by investing over $100 billion in improved bus, rail, and ferry service. Housing strategies work together to utilizing the three Ps of, of protection, preservation, and production to reduce housing cost burdens, accommodate fu projected future population growth, and increase access to opportunity. Economic strategies seek to improve economic mobility through investments in job training and an envisioned statewide universal basic income program, as well as to shift the location of jobs to tackle our region's spatial imbalance of jobs and housing by incentivizing job growth in transit accessible, housing rich areas. Finally, environmental strategies put forth a comprehensive vision for a more sustainable and resilient region. Strategies reduce, ris uh, reduce risks from hazards introdu by introducing mitigation measures for sea level rise and retrofitting homes and public buildings to better withstand earthquakes. Strategies would preserve the region's valuable open space in parks and expand access in communities in little green space. And uh, also a suite of investments target greenhouse gas emission re reductions, supporting, including support for clean vehicles and transportation demand management programs. And more information on all 35 strategies is available on planbayarea.org. Each of these 35 strategies have been crafted with an eye toward equity. Transportation strategies include discounts on fares and tolls to reduce the cost burden of getting from point A to point B, investments in improving local bus service and advancing mobility so solutions identified by communities with the fewest resources. Housing strategies encourage affordable housing in high resource areas, some of which have historically excluded families with lower incomes to enable greater access to resources available in those communities. Environmental strategies will prioritize protecting all equity priority communities from sea level rise and direct resources for residential upgrades for families with low incomes. And finally, economic strategies like the universal basic income and support for high speed internet would po bolster the social safety net and enhance upward uh, economic mobility. The strategies help to accommodate the forecasted regional growth over the next three decades, totaling 1.4 million new households and 1.4 million new jobs between 2015 and 2050. And they focus growth in areas that help to advance critical climate and equity goals, including locally nominated priority development areas and priority production areas, and regionally identified transit rich and high resource areas. Focusing these growths in locations within existing urban growth boundaries helps to protect natural and agricultural lands from development, while also reducing risks from hazards like wildfire. Turning now to what Plan Bay, the Bay Area of 2050 might look like with all of these strategies implemented, here are a few highlights from our modeling analysis of future conditions. Plan Bay Area 2050 makes meaningful headway towards reducing the high cost burden of housing and transportation the first time a Bay Area regional plan has made a dent. The average household would spend less of their income on combined housing and transportation costs with even greater reductions for households with low incomes. Increased housing production, particularly the production of affordable housing, combined with transit fare reforms, lower the cost of taking transit help to contribute to this trend. Plan makes significant investments to expand the region's transit and active transportation network, reducing the share of people that drive to work by 20 percentage points as more people take transit, walk, bike, or work from home. Improving, to access, improving access to opportunity is another aim of the plan. Strategies in Plan Barrier 2050 that incentivize affordable housing production in places that have historically excluded new housing would increase access to opportunities like well-funded schools and open space. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions is another goal of the plan. Strategies across all four elements work in unison to lower emissions, enabling the plan to meet its state-mandated emissions reductions target. 
Environmental strategies also protect nearly all homes threatened by two feet of sea level rise from flooding. Finally, strategies that influence the location of new jobs and housing would improve the region's imbalance of jobs and housing, enabling shorter commute region-wide. Specifically in Santa Clara, the, the strategy would uh, include the completion of BART to Silicon Valley, uh, as well as improved infrastructure and frequencies on the Calchain corridor, uh, which will enable future high-speed rail service, as well as upgrades at Diridon Station. Uh, with, uh, in terms of our strategy to transform aging malls and office parks into neighborhoods, uh, there are uh, a focus on areas such as the Great Mall, the Eastridge Center, and Valco Mall, uh, you know, developing those into more walkable and complete communities. Um, and finally, uh, you know, by enabling greater commercial development opportunities within walking distance to transit, the, strat uh, the strategy strategies would enable Santa Clara County to more closely align future job and retail centers with BART and VTA rail networks. Okay, so that was the overall of, uh, overview of Plan B Area 2050, which is our current long-range plan, and we are now in the process of kicking off an update to that plan, Plan B Area 2050 Plus. So I'll give a brief overview of the scope and schedule of that effort here. So the, um, per federal and state law, the plan must be updated every four years with the next statutory deadline coming in fall 2025. We previously went to our planning committee in December of 2022, where we proposed to advance two long-range planning efforts in parallel, Plan Barrier 2050 Plus, which would be a limited and focused or minor update to Plan Barrier 2050, and Transit 2050 Plus, which is a service-oriented, physically constrained transit network plan for the region. So in terms of what makes this a minor update, most importantly, there is no parallel required RENA or regional housing needs allocation process um, from the state that we have to align with this time around. And we also have that same greenhouse gas emissions reductions target from the California Air Resources Board. For Transit 2050 Plus, uh, this really came about from the challenges posed by our region's fra fragmented transit system, which the COVID pandemic tr um, very much brought to light. So one way to think about it is that we are looking at a limited and focused update to the plan's 29 non-transit related strategies, while the six transit related strategies are in for a more comprehensive overhaul through Transit 2050 Plus. But the results of that parallel planning process will eventually feed into the final Plan Bay Area 2050. Honing back in on scope, it goes without saying that the plan will address all federal and state planning requirements. Um, but what we are looking to do is leverage the vision and guiding principles established in Plan Barrier 2050, uh, which we previously uh, reviewed. We also will leverage the existing plan's strategic framework and organization, including its division into four interrelated elements, as well as its focus on 11 key themes and 35 adopted strategies. So that will really provide our starting point and foundation. And finally, we want to focus on three core priorities for the effort, uh, our, with the effort. Education in terms of our outreach and engagement, implementation, and updated assumptions. And I'll explain what we mean by that um, on this slide. So in terms of education, one of the key things we heard during our required public participation plan process is that the public is much less interested in providing input, per se, than in learning more about who we are, what we do, and why. And this is something we want to lean into with the plan's engagement efforts, explaining in clear, accessible language and materials the purpose, strategies, and impacts of the plan. With respect to implementation, we adopted this major plan less than two years ago, and there's a lot happening in the here and now to make, uh, that is central to making the long range vision a reality. We think it's important for the appropriate energy and intention to remain focused within those realms, both from an overall um, staffing as well as from a strategic perspective. And this includes things such as potential regional revenue measures to support transit as well as affordable housing, um, as well as expansion of programs such as our electrification program, including charging stations, uh, also ongoing support for local jurisdictions through our regional housing technical assistance program. Further, just as we leaned on our planned strategies to inform our infl implementation efforts, we want to lean on our implementation efforts to inform potential refinements to these strategies. Essentially, what have we learned from the last two years of work that can help us inform how the strategies might be revised in the future? 
And with respect to updated assumptions, we want to ground the plan more firmly in the post-COVID environment by updating the plan's technical and planning assumptions, at least in those areas where we have new data, better data, and meaningfully different data than we did for the last planning cycle, as well as in areas that are likely to impact the plan's outcomes. So this includes travel patterns and transit ridership, our revenue forecasts, tele uh, assumptions about work from home, as well as the trajectory of the regional economy, among other areas. So we're here in summer 2023 at the start of a nearly two and a half year planning process. There will be four rounds of public and partner stakeholder engagement in summer 23, spring 24, fall 24, <clears throat> as well as spring and summer of 2025. Over the next year, we'll be hard at work on the draft and final blueprint, which are essentially the first drafts of the plan, identifying the strategies, public policies, and investments that comprise the plan before transitioning into the final phase of the plan from fall 2024 um, through fall 2025. <clears throat> and uh, again, the, the final plan is slated for adoption in uh, fall 2025. So in terms of some of the next steps, um, there, a first round of public engagement is taking place this summer, and we have a, a list of pop-up locations that are taking, uh, 15 pop-ups that are taking place throughout the Nine County uh, Bay Area, uh, including in Santa Clara County that are available on planbayarea.org. Um, there will also be a survey, uh, as well as workshops and webinars focused for local jurisdiction and county staff um, later in August and September. And then we will be returning to our committees over the course of 2023 to uh, discuss a variety of topics, including you know, what, where we think we're going with some of these planning assumptions, where we're anticipating to refine the strategies of the plan, what we heard during our public engagement efforts, uh, and then finally um, with the MTC and ABAG taking action to adopt those um, strategies for the draft blueprint. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. That was an excellent <laughs> presentation. And I really liked your, uh, your slides. It was more like reading a graphic novel. There was so much stuff in there. <laughs> there, was a, there was really a lot to consume. So thank you very much. An excellent presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from the commission? Commissioner Belska. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. That was very informative. Um, I'm curious, um, I'm, I'm new to the commission, so I'm probably learning quite a few things. So how does the, this plan and the county's general plan work together? So, you know, Plan Bay Area is a, uh, a, a vision. It's a vision document. It, you know, it does not, um, it does not change any local land use uh, it, you know, it does not have local land use authority or anything of that nature. What the plan merely shows is, you know, if the plan were implemented, this is how we would achieve our regional goals as well as, you know, various require, um, planning requirements that are established by the state. So it, it really shows how we can meet planning goals as opposed to, um, you know, requiring how to do it. So, you know, the, the county, uh, the general plan update process is obviously, you know, still within the, the county's purview, but the, um, you know, the, the Plan Bay Area document and, you know, assumptions about, uh, you know, future growth and, and where growth is located does demonstrate, you know, how we can meet, again, our greenhouse gas reduction targets, our requirements in terms of, you know, uh, a land use pattern that can accommodate all of the region's future projected growth, which is what the plan is supposed to do. Uh, so I guess my next question then would be directed at our department. Um, how much of this plan gets incorporated or will get incorporated into the county's general plan? Like how much does the county actually, you know, rely on, utilize these recommendations? Sure, through the chair, Lisa McKyle. As, as the department moves through updating its various elements of the general plan, we utilize guidelines and vision plans of the region and the state uh, to make sure that we're um, as in sync as we believe that we should be with those plans. There's not a requirement to do so. 
uh, in some cir circumstances, such as like the housing element update, um, there are needs to be in line with regional documents that ABAG would issue. Um, but right now, we are not doing a comprehensive general plan update. In the future, we would. And at that time that we embark on that effort, we would look at certain areas that we would want to align with. Okay, thank you. Um, and then final question. Um, in your report, um, you talk about uh, 1.4 million new households expected by 2050, uh, but recent reports coming out are saying that Bay Area population growth has stalled. Um, are, are you ad adjusting your planning based on uh, that, those statistics? So that is one of the key things that we will be looking at this summer is, is what is termed the, the regional growth forecast, which is the, the pr a projection of the region's you know, uh, anticipated households, uh, housing units, jobs, population, and so forth. Uh, I think you know, certainly in, in light of developments over the, the past you know, couple of years, it will be uh, important to, to revisit that, um, those assumptions. Um, I will clarify, though, that you know, the, the projection that, uh, that MTC and ABAG utilizes is what we call a, a strategy-based forecast as opposed to a business-as-usual or status quo forecast. Um, so one of the, the key things that, that we do in, in our projections is we try to evaluate, um, you know, what if we were to implement these strategies in the plan that were to increase the affordability and the accessibility of housing in the Bay Area, and that that in turn would, uh, you know, draw more people to the region. So it's, it's not just looking at what current conditions are like, it's also evaluating what conditions might look like in the future if we were to take action to address the region's um, housing crisis. So I, I think that's, you know, that's where, you know, you will see um, there are all different types of forecasts out there um, from different entities, and that is one way in which our, our forecast does differ. But as I said, we are very much taking, you know, the developments of the past couple years in line and will be um, looking at how to revise our, our you know, or, or uh, update the forecast from the previous plan. Yeah, how many, <clears throat> excuse me, how many jurisdictions are within, uh, are, are covered by this report? I, I believe it's 109 uh, jurisdictions in the nine county uh, Bay Area. Okay, so j just a couple of just random thoughts on, on this. Um, most of the time we bang our heads against problems because we feel that they are regional issues and it's not something that any one particular jurisdiction can resolve. And so I, I totally applaud the effort of, of trying to get everybody sort of going in the same direction. Um, so, I, you know, I appreciate your report. And um, a, a lot of the, the outreach, it, it seems, it is important. You know, who can say, hey, it's, it's it, more is better to get kind of buy-in. But I think a lot of the problems are already very well known that, that we are facing in, in the Bay Area. And so I don't know how much more research needs to be done in trying to identify problems and getting people to say what their problems are because I, th I think we already know now it, it comes down to uh, what's the best strategy for getting through those problems and how can we get buy-in you know, from a lot of the people in the jurisdictions and everything. Um, for. I know in the South County, transportation is huge and, and it's bottlenecked and people are stuck in traffic and, and there's really no reason for that. Um, I, I think with the, I don't know if Commissioner Belska is mentioning, they, they had in the local paper, they had even yesterday just a report on you know how many people are leaving. Um, I think Santa Clara County ultimately, they said, would have a slight increase over time. And I think we have a pent up demand for more housing. So even if the, um, the amount of people stayed static, I, I think we could still provide a lot more affordable housing for people because some people just can't afford it. So I think the goals of still trying to get the barriers out of the way 
for providing housing are still important. And the same for transportation. Ultimately, not everyone's gonna be able to use public transportation, and so we have to improve our existing transportation corridors also. And I just don't see much talk about that. And some of that, I don't know, is um, San Benito County part of this, or are they, because that's, that's where we're hitting up against, is, is trying to get some of the highways connected to them and, and through all the way to Salinas and, and other places. And so um, that that's just some of our frustrations in South County are, um, I think would be helped by this and, and some of it kind of go beyond that. But um, again, thanks for the, I don't know how many, you had 39 or whatever. Some of that is very specific and, and, I, and I, I hope that having so many things don't just get lost that we're still prioritizing, but, but ultimately you definitely went, went beyond just the surface fluff and, and really took a deep dive. So I appreciate that. So those are my comments, thanks. Great, thank you very much. A couple, uh, just uh, piggybacking on what Commissioner Rouser was saying. I was curious with the, the fact that, that uh, local jurisdictions still have the uh, control over the planning and such. If, well, what's the sense now that you've, you've published a report and working on the update in terms of the uh, openness and uh, embracing of the goals um, and strategies by jurisdictions, is it getting better? Are you seeing more traction? Because there's such a wide range of approaches from city to city and from county to county, and I was just curious how that's looking. Um, I, I, it's an excellent question, and um, I think I, you know, I, 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 I don't want to get too stray far from my own lane, which is in kind of the long-range planning world. And I think I, I think what you're you're raising is sort of a would be a great question for our our uh, housing and local planning team that has been you know working very closely with the jurisdictions. I think you know what I will say is that um, you know the experiences of the last few years, we have been fortunate to get um, a fair amount of money from the state to really support local jurisdiction planning. So there's been, a, I think, and I know, you know, some of the frustrations we've heard from local jurisdiction partners is that, you know, you, you come up with these big plans, but then, you know, there's no help for us to actually be able to, to do anything with it. So there's been a, a real major investment in technical assistance programs and and resources and planning collaboratives um, that have been made available over the past couple years to help jurisdictions do their housing element updates, um, to help them understand uh, you know how they can apply for funding that can help them do the type of planning that aligns with Plan Bay area. So you know we have grant programs for we what are called priority development areas. Um, you know, other kind of locally nominated um, geographies. Um, and I, I, I believe our team has had like, you know, good success in, in getting money out the door and, and finding that, that partnership and um, collaboration at the, at the local level. But I, I would certainly defer to them to give more of a, a granular, um, granular insights yeah. on kind of what's happening with that. Yeah, I was gonna say it would be great, you know, to get kind of an update on the, you know, the, the uptake of the funds and what the results have been and you know real on the ground changes that may be occurring and i just one other question and in that um you know we the county wrestled with the housing element um, allocation this year and i know that i believe that's set by the hcd but is there a um relationship uh between abag uh, mtc in terms of and hcd because it, it re we, we had some issues, we resolved them luckily, but it was difficult when there was a significant increase in the allocation for a county who's specifically not in the urban and development business, and uh, with, with one exception. But, um, you know, so I was just wondering, because there are many counties in the Bay Area that have similar policies to not, you know, condone more sprawl or develop farmland, and yet, you know, there was a lot of struggle, not he, not only here, but I know Sonoma County and probably elsewhere. And just what's the relationship in terms of 
communicating some of those issues because I, I was struck by the allocation being so significant for the county that specifically is trying to be more of a focus on natural resource protection and, and things. Um, with its conflict with the environmental goals, you know, and resource conservation goals of the regional plan. Um, so just to clarify, the, the, the question is, what, what is the relationship of Plan Bay Area to the regional housing needs allocation process? Or the agencies themselves, you know, MTCA bag. Yeah, yeah so the, the, I guess just from a, like a process standpoint, you know, the HCD sets the, you know, the levels, right? And then ABAG, as the Council of Governments for the region, um, has to develop a methodology by which to, you know, distribute that allocation. Um, so that process took place as part of Plan Bay Area 2050. Um, and, you know, the, the relationship is really that, you know, the plan, Plan Bay Area, has to identify areas that can accommodate the regional housing needs allocation and then the RENA has to follow the development pattern um, that is uh, specified in the long range plan. Um, and, you know, MTC handles the, the long range transportation plan. So it's, you know, MTC and ABAG together produce the, the long range regional plan, which for certain plan cycles, not the one that we're engaging in now, um, has to align with the regional housing needs allocation process. Um, to your, your, I think to your point on um, kind of the, the conflict that can sometimes exist between, you know, environmental protection and, and resource planning, um, we are engaged in um, a, a refresh of what we call our priority conservation area, and um, that really has to do with how we are implementing the environmental vision of the plan, which does seek to you know, maintain urban growth boundaries, protect uh, high value conservation and agricultural lands. And that's one of the key things that we're really looking at in that planning effort is, um, you know, how can we make this sort of framework for regional growth align with and make sense with our environmental um, protection goals so that, you know, we're, we're able to, to um, accomplish both and that they're, they're not so much in, in conflict with each other. Yeah, no, obviously that's that's the goal. And, and it was just the concern is, you know, in the future, in the next, you know, eight years from now or so, that if an additional large allocation is given to the county, it has very, you know, there's limited places unless it's going to go into those resource areas, you know, because a very clear delineation between what is urban is, you know, in, incorporated cities and, uh, with only the exception of really Stanford University. So so anyway, I'm just saying for the future, it, it's really going to be important that, that that be addressed before the RENA numbers come out the next time around. Thank you. Any other questions here? All right, then, uh, I have a couple of comments I'd like to make. Uh, first of all, I'd like to applaud you for this long-term vision and doing this from a regional perspective. I think that it's critical that we look at problems from a regional perspective. Within a mile as the crow flies from my house, I have Cupertino, Santa Clara, and Saratoga. <laughs> There's you know, four, in essence, four jurisdictions all within a mile circle to my, you know. Uh, and, and so it's critical that we coordinate, everybody coordinates. Um, and so I'd like to know, and this is, I think, a theme that we've been following tonight amongst the commissioners, is how do we implement this vision? I know I've, this has been asked, but you know, with, the, with HCD and the arena numbers, there's real teeth. You do it or you get hit by not getting money, you get hit with builder's remedy. You, you really get hammered if you don't follow the rules with the housing element. Uh, but on, on this, I see it's a very soft approach, and I don't know how we, how you can put any teeth in there so that we do actually have a regional vision that can be implemented? Um, I mean, I, I will say that, uh, you know, one of the key, and I, I think this is, this is relevant to some of the other comments that came up, you know, I think we, we are really trying to lean into implementation in terms of, of our focus areas, but um, 
in, in pursuing those implementation efforts, it's important to um, you know, distinguish between uh, where MTC and ABAG have a lead role, you know, where we're more of a partner, and where you know, we need to take a, a back seat um, and support efforts that are you know, being led elsewhere in, in the region. Um, and I think, you know, in those areas where, where we have authority, where we have fu funding, where we have technical capacity, um, you know, we're really trying to, to push forward on some of these key um, enabling um, efforts that are going to support, you know, uh, the region's overall success, whether it's a potential revenue measure for transportation or for, or for housing or, uh, you know, uh, supporting, um, you know, priority uh, planning areas. Um, but, you know, in many other of those cases, we're really a partner to, to the local jurisdictions. And, and how can we be a more effective partner? Again, we, hopefully through efforts such as our regional housing technical assistance program, uh, county collaboratives, and, and really making money and resources available to, to the locals who are going to be doing this work on the ground. Um, so it's, you know, it's really having to push forward on many different fronts at, at once. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Because we know there's you know, there's some bad players out there. Saratoga and Cupertino aren't always the best when it comes to housing. And San Jose is not very good when it comes to parks and open space. Uh, and I think that qual maintaining the quality of life uh, in our area requires all these things. And it's to be nice to see that we have some organization that helps drive that. Um, when I took a look at the timeline on this, it's two and a half years until you sign off on the dotted line. It's a year and a half long until we get the blueprint completed. With that much time still before it's completed, how much of the vision is already in place and how much is it still available for potential modification for us to, to have our say and say, we really want to see this in there? Um, so I, as I said, I think you know we are we are trying to pursue this as a as a limited and focused update. So you know the we're I think we have received some you know some buy-in from our, our our policymakers in terms of relying on the the vision the the vision and the guiding principles. But we do want to pursue you know targeted updates to the strategies based upon everything that's happened over the last couple of years. Um, so you know. Our engagement requirements do not change, whether it's a major plan or a minor plan. So, you know, we will be out in the region and we will be having workshops and we will be holding webinars. And, you know, we, we try to be as, you know, comprehensive as possible in making those opportunities available for our partners to participate in those efforts. Um, so, you know, the first the uh, first round of that work is, is going to be happening this summer and, and in the early fall. Um, we'll go out again in, in the spring and, um, you know, we'll really be looking to hear from, from our, our county and local jurisdiction partners about, you know, what, what does the new normal look like for all of you? How has, how has your work changed over the last couple okay. of years? How has your perspective changed? Um, and what kind of updates would you like yeah. to see? So what I'm hearing is there's uh, room for some minor improvements, direction, but the major direction is fairly well set I, I I think with, so, with, you know, with respect to the, um, you know, the kind of 29 strategies, um, I would say that from a, a staff perspective, we're not proposing to make major changes, but we are obviously, uh, we report to our policy board um, and we uh, engage with uh, the public and our partners and stakeholders. Um, and, you know, ultimately if there were, uh, you know, an interest or an appetite amongst, you know, uh, a critical mass of whether it's the, 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 the public or partners or, and, and obviously our, our policy makers who, who are the ultimate decision makers, you know, it, it would ultimately be up to them. But at the start of the process, our recommendation is um, to, to focus some of the, those major overhauls primarily in the transit space, just because our, our transit systems are really in kind of an acute crisis at the moment. Um, so that's where I think a lot of the, the energy in terms of a major overhaul is going to be, is in re-looking re at the, the transit strategies of the plan to reflect kind of the, the current moment that we're in. Okay, great. Well, one of the things I'd like to see focus on is, is the quality of life issues, uh, particularly parks and open space. 
and, and sustainability. And I don't see the word sustainability, I don't think, in here at all, which I think is a mistake. I think we should be focusing on sustainability uh, very heavily, not just, uh, not just the greenhouse, uh, you know, the climate crisis, because we're ever in the middle of the sixth grade extinction, uh, and that should be focused on as well. Um, but if you go on to slide number eight, I think it's eight, seven. <coughs> For example, when you say expand access to parks and open space, it would be great if it used the same terminology that says protect and preserve. What's the word in here? It was, uh, yeah, protect, preserve, and expand open space. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would like to see a little more focus from the environmental perspective on here and quote unquote quality of life issues. I think the housing, transportation, the economy, all those are critical as well. Uh, but I think it, it, often there's not a voice on the other side, and so the balance isn't always in place. All right. any, any other comments here? And then we'll call it. Through the chair, just a quick question to Chirag. Um, in terms of plan, the Plan Bay Area plan itself, uh, does that get reviewed by the ABAG board and are, is there county participation from our board of supervisors in this process? Uh, yes, so the, the board, um, so the plan is subject to approval by both the MTC commission and the ABAG executive board. Um, and you know Santa Clara County is uh, is you know well represented on on both of those um, both of those bodies. Um, include um, you know I think for the the MTC Commission we have uh, a member of the Board of Supervisors as well as the Mayor of San Jose, um, and on the ABAG Executive Board we have you know supervisors as well as uh, local jurisdiction representatives um, on on the board. Okay. Any more questions here? Well, thank you very much. I have one more question. Uh, you said that the first outreach is through the summer of 23, which is right now, and you're doing part of that outreach as we speak. Um, where else in our area in the South Bay are you going to be uh, doing presentations and workshops? So uh, I can pull that up for you in just one moment. Um, in the South Bay, we will be... Um, at the uh, uh, Gilroy Farmer's Market on Saturday, August 26th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And uh, we will also be at Silicon Valley Pride on Sunday, August 27th from 12 to uh, 3 p.m. at uh, Plaza de Cesar Chavez Park. Uh, and there are uh, more details available on um, planbayarea.org on our meetings and events All right. page. Well, thank you very much. I, I would encourage you to have, you know, this is uh, millions of people down here, and I would encourage you to have some additional workshops that are very well publicized so that the general public can comment. That, seem, that seems like a fairly light agenda as far as outreach to this area. So yeah, as I mentioned, we will also have a, a survey that will be available. Uh, you know, we take comments on the PlainBayArea.org uh, website, and then there will be uh, uh, workshops and webinars that are targeted more towards uh, 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 governmental partners, um, and we'll be sending out invitations to, um, to that effect uh, in the next week or so. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It was an excellent presentation, and you did a Good, great job at answering our questions. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And if I just could pay a special thank you to Chirag for coming down here uh, as a courtesy to provide this training uh, and assist the planning commissioners from a knowledge base. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Appreciate your time and effort. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda, item six, is the Stanford University Community Plan Update Report. Through the chair, Lisa McKyle, we have with us today uh, our consulting project managers from M Group, uh, Brittany Bendix, who will provide the presentation. And we also have uh, um, Jeff Bradley, who is the president of M Group. And we have our senior planner in charge of Stanford, uh, the program overall, Charu Alawalia. I'll go ahead and hand it over to Brittany. Welcome. And, and while they are setting up, um, I would confirm that we had no speakers for item number five. 
One Thank more you. supplement. This is a status update on the community plan and where we're at and next steps, brief overview of next steps. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for having me. I'm Brittany Bendix, consulting deputy project manager, along with Jeff Bradley, consulting project manager and principal and president at M Group. Today's presentation includes an overview of the recommended refinements to the Stanford Community Plan. Our goal today is to receive feedback from the commission and provide an update on the progress of the SCP update since the Board of Supervisors meeting on December 13th, 2023. Our agenda for today's presentation includes a brief background of the SCP and Board of Supervisors direction from the December 2022 board meeting. We will then provide an overview of the recommended policy updates to the community plan before concluding with an update on the ongoing effort to coordinate with other jurisdictions and providing next steps in the plan's overall approval process. Additionally, I will take a moment to pause after each chapter topic to request if the commission would like to ask any questions or provide comments on that chapter. To start with some context, the current Stanford Community Plan, or SCP, was adopted in 2000 and amended in 2015. Then in November 2016, Stanford University submitted a general use permit application, which instigated an effort by the county to update the 2000 community plan. This process is generally referred to as the 2018 general use permit or GUP review. As you are aware, the GUP application was ultimately withdrawn by Stanford in November 2019. However, given the progress already made by the county staff on both the GUP application and the community plan update, at a Board of Supervisors meeting in February 2020, the Board directed county staff to continue its process to update the Stanford Community Plan as part of an update to the countywide general plan. This direction also included a request for further analysis regarding Stanford's activities rel relative to the provision of municipal services, graduate student housing affordability, and childcare. The resulting studies were shared with the community in April of, and May of last year. Since 2000, since the February 2020 meeting, the administration has prepared ongoing updates to the SEP and has shared these updates with county commissioners, commissions, and community groups. The previous update provided to the Planning Commission was in the fall of 2022. Recommendations from the Planning Commission were then shared with the Board of Supervisors for their consideration. At the December 2022 board meeting, the supervisors voted unanimously to take the following actions. One, receive the report relating to the final recommended Stanford Community Plan update, reflecting feedback from the Board of Supervisors, Stanford University, and community stakeholders. And two, they declared the administration, rec they declared the administration recommended Stanford Community Plan update to be the proposed project and directed the administration to complete the environmental impact report and take other necessary actions to submit the plan to the board for final consideration and adoption in 2023. The board also directed the administra administration to perform several actions, including responding to the request from the city of Palo Alto for a tri-party agreement consistent with the 19, sorry, meeting, tri-party meeting consistent with the 1985 land use policy agreement and conduct outreach to the Palo Alto Unified School District regarding school site location issues, including traffic and safety. Two, contacting the County of San Mateo relating to an analysis of the total property tax exemption provided to Stanford University within the San Mateo County area. Three, reporting to the board on a date uncertain relating to an analysis of the circulation chapter refinements and framework for trip metrics, including associated traffic impacts on the College Terrace neighborhood. Four, ensuring, ensuring transparency and the ability for the public to provide input relating to the expansion of a streamlined permit processing through the Stanford Community Plan. Five, coordinating with Stanford University to ensure public availability of data relating to additional policies or implementation measures for inclusion in the SCP update to address sexual assaults. Implementation measures relating to behavioral health services that may include metrics that reflect quality of services, such as utilization rates and total number of users, percentage of individuals accessing healthcare, and staffing levels, 
and public availability of the annual customer service survey of mental and behavioral health services to gauge program satisfaction levels of students, employees, and residents. And six, revising chapter three of the SEP update to retain the second paragraph on page number 70 of the track changes version of the SEP update and to update new data relating to an imbalance between jobs and housing in the Mid-Peninsula subregion. Today we will provide responses to these directives from the Board of Supervisors, share the most recent chapter refinements reflecting ongoing discussions with Stanford, and summarize general cleanup and updates provided to offer increased clarification and transparency for the direction of the SCP. The introduction to the document includes updates to key findings established in the special studies on municipal services, graduate student housing, affordability, and childcare. The proposed revisions update the list of findings for the municipal services study to reflect the findings as stated in the study and provide clarification to the list of findings from the child care study and summarize the study's narrative on key findings to offer greater transparency and support for the SEP's policies. Similar to the general plan, the SEP contains seven chapters that cover different land use topics. This includes growth and development, land use, housing, circulation, open space, resource conservation, and health and safety. Again, at the end of each chapter, we will pause for questions and feedback, but we will begin now with the growth and development chapter. Beginning in the growth and development chapter and con continuing throughout the SCP update, greater clarification is made with revisions to Stanford's academic uses to include academic support and housing uses. This has been reviewed closely by staff and does not represent a change in policy. Furthermore, at the request of Stanford, the SCP eliminates two implementation measures that were identified as recommend recommendations from the municipal services studies that respond to feedback from the city of Palo Alto. The two implementation measures to be removed are one, SCP GDI 15, which requires the coordination of all proposed lighting modifications or additions with uh, Palo Alto Utilities and SCP GDI 16, which would require the university to document its fiber system. The elimination of these two policies has been confirmed and agreed upon from communication with the City of Palo Alto and the department. Additionally, the SCP Municipal Services Study includes the following recommendations that are included in the SCP update as implementation measures GDI 5, GDI-6, and GDI-7. For GDI-5, Stanford shall provide a functional organizational chart for all municipal services, along with the staff member responsible for providing service-related data on an annual basis. SCP GDI-6, Stanford shall provide complete service and performance metrics for all municipal services, including appropriations and staffing levels for the last three years, along with annual updates. SCP GDI 7, Stanford shall develop and deploy an annual survey of customers to assess customer awareness and satisfaction levels with all municipal services. Since the December 2022 board meeting, the department has had ongoing discussions with Stanford regarding the approach and feasibility of implementing these policies and efficiently making this information available to the general public as well as the county. The update has included revisions to implementation measures GDI 5 through 7 that would require Stanford to provide and maintain a publicly available municipal services website that provides the following. A list of all the 26 municipal service areas identified in the municipal services study and the appropriate contact information. Related service and performance metrics for all municipal services. Information on how to provide immediate and direct feedback to that service provider information on how the public may participate in or access any related customer service, customer satisfaction surveys, a feedback form through the municipal services website where the public can provide input on municipal service concerns, as well as Stanford shall provide a compilation of the feedback received through the municipal services website to the county on an annual basis. The department is continuing discussions with the consultant who prepared the municipal services study, as well as Stanford, to provide additional analysis and follow-up to refine the process for reporting these metrics. We will now pause for any questions by the commission. 
Yes, uh, Commissioner Rouser. Yeah, uh, thank you, and it's good seeing you guys again. Um, again, just general comments. Stanford is, they cover six jurisdictions, and there's at least three controlling documents on this thing, and it, it's, it's complicated. And I, my hat's off to the new people who are jumping into this and, and, and trying to make sense of it. A um, couple of just overall questions. Um, is everything within what we're going through today part of the Planning Commission's sort of area of expertise or some of these, and, and we've raised this comment before, um, some of these kind of seem like areas that we're not really experts in. And, and so um, I'm hoping we can kind of just concentrate on the areas that are within our charter or whatever and not necessarily get bogged down into things that are outside. Um, the, in the introduction, th these are just, I, I have a bunch of kind of s silly typos or, or edits or whatever, so do I just bring those up now or do we wanna through, save through that the chair, for if, later? It's, if it's at the level of typos um, in, in the interest of time, it's, it's up to the Planning Commission and at your pleasure, but we can certainly take those offline and then incorporate them later. Okay, um, I kind of prefer that just because um, this is a very long document. Um, can you define for me academic support because that's, that's going everywhere, so I just want to make sure that I have a fundamental understanding of that I understand what you guys are trying to say by that since we're changing that almost throughout the whole document. I'll ask my colleagues here to look up the official definition of academic support spaces, but from a practical standpoint, um, academic support spaces are uses on the campus that are allowed by the by the existing general existing community plan and the proposed changes to the community plan, as well as references in the 1985 policy agreement. So, like you said, it's it's baked in, baked into all the all the foundational documents. But the idea is that. Uh, there's some non-academic uses that su directly support the academic uses, which are teaching, research, that we can all visualize as academic uses. These academic support uses, the examples frequently given include the post office, the public safety building, the, the daycare for the kids that need daycare. So all those kind of tangential uses that are clearly uh, necessary and desirable to be close by are are scooped up in that in that category of academic support okay and then just as a threshold question again when, when we're talking about municipality like services and everything are we expecting Stanford to provide any and all services and and or pay for anything so because there was some discussion like on property tax, you know, they're exempt from property tax and yet, you know, we have done that as a policy for a reason to nonprofit organizations. Are we, are we trying to kind of do an end around to that in some of these areas and say, well, property tax normally pays for this kind of stuff and so we're gonna uh, figure out other ways to, to get that money. Is it literally, are we trying to just say every jurisdiction needs to be made 100% whole from Stanford from, uh, for any type of impacts that they're having? And at some point, do we say we're just gonna negate all the benefits that they give to the whole Bay Area and beyond? <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that. Um, the property tax exemption is an exemption from the 1%. Municipal services like sewer, you know, what those, there's not an exemption from that. So uh, now that's kind of a general principle. Stanford, because of Stanford's situation, their municipal services are provided in a variety of ways, which I'll toss back to Jeff Bradley, but just speaking about th the property tax issue, that's a, a separate thing versus municipal municipal services. Okay, good. And, and I mean, I, I saw the matrix, and I mean, it's very elaborate on 
what they're providing and everything. And um, just as a general comment on, again, a lot of the things that they're measuring, and we brought this up the last time it was in front of us, it seems like a lot of those may or may not be worth the effort of trying, the value of those measurements aren't worth the effort of trying to collect them. And so I would like to just throw out there, do we know how many fire systems that the county is testing on an annual basis? And if it's good for the goose, is it good for the gander? So are, are these types of things that we're asking Stanford to report, is that something that we should be asking any and all jurisdictions that, that we're dealing with to report this kind of stuff? Just, just as a philosophical question. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Belska. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, so uh, I guess um, my first question is, uh, so we received three versions of the plan, the clean version, the one with changes since 2000, and the ones with changes since 2022. Um, but you mentioned that the currently approved version is the 2015 version. Um, so did we get a, a version that just showed changes since the 2015 draft? As, as a practical matter, uh, Commissioner Belska, sorry, I can't really see you through the podium <laughs> and, and talk directly into my microphone at the same time. Um, we refer to the currently adopted Stanford Community Plan as the 2000 Community Plan because that's when it was initially adopted. But it does, as you noted correctly, include minor revisions most recently made up to and including 2015. So that, that version uh, that we've referred to as the 2000 Community Plan with changes is essentially the most recent version of the 2000 plan. So, so that's just showing changes, that version is showing changes since 2015. Correct. Okay. Uh, the changes proposed as part of this discrete okay. community plan update that started back in 2020. Okay. Um, so the other thing is um, everything is referring to 26 identified municipal services. Um, I, I counted the matrix three times and I keep coming up with 27. Um, so what are we missing? If you counted three times, I, I, we, will, we will recount as well and uh, try to square that number. <laughs> okay, but either that or I'm just really bad at counting, but I, I, I kept counting and recounting and it keeps coming out to 27. <laughs> Thank you. I trust, I trust your number, but we'll double, we'll double check. <laughs> Maybe you should, but definitely double check. Um, okay, so then um, uh, Stanford submitted a, a, a comment uh, which, which I, I tend to, to agree with that a lot of these metrics being asked for are, are really onerous. Um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's great, it would be fabulous if you know, we had that much transparency and that much statistical data about every single little thing. But I, I can't imagine, and, and I'm actually curious about the cost of the effort to, to co actually collect that huge amount of data, especially for the last three years, and, and you know, where that funding is supposed to come from. If I may? through the chair, respond to Commissioner Belska on that important issue. We, we consultant team, project team, county staff, the administration have received very clear direction on exactly that matter from the board of supervisors in this chambers back in December of last year. And the direction we received it, um, in plain words, is essentially to, to go back and reevaluate all of those metrics that you, you were looking at and really decide which ones are needed and can be collected and is reasonable to request or require Stanford to provide every year for all time until that policy would be re revised or, or not. Um, and to not create something that's just making work for Stanford and making work for county staff. And so that's why Brittany in her presentation indicated that is one area where we're still working closely with Stanford County staff and the municipal services consultant who actually prepared the report 
Um, and I think we're making I think we're making good progress in that area. So I just wanted to to get that out there. Okay, so so I'm to understand that the version we're looking at now is not in fact the the final version that it's, will be going for and it's, approval. It's it's if I may respond, um, that's correct. The, and then and that fact is most notable in this issue that you put your finger on about the metrics. Okay, um, so so then the. The final item I wanted to address is, so, so first off, um, there are multiple line items um, on, that, on that matrix that are not Stanford. So they're municipal services that are external to Stanford. Um, and there are metrics and customer satisfaction surveys required for, for those as well, um, which could be very challenging for Stanford to obtain since that's something completely out of their out of their control um, so you know for example um, Stanford Hospital Palo Alto Fire Department uh, Santa Clara County Animal Control PG&E um, those are all listed as those are all identified as a primary um, service provider and there was a list of required metrics to be provided by Stanford. Um, how, how is that proposed to work? At, if I may, um, through the chair, at a high level, the Stanford is provided the opportunity to provide the required services either directly through their own efforts and forces, or as you mentioned, through a car contract with a third party, uh, either governmental uh, or, or private, firms that can provide a, a service. Um, but ultimately, the idea behind the tri-party agreement and the subsequent community plan policies is that it's Stanford is required to provide, is responsible for the provision of adequate municipal services for its own campus, which over the years they've, they've, done, a, they've done a great job with. And the, so this is really about, even whether it's directly provided by Stanford or provided by a third party, there's still in a policy within, embedded within the community plan for more transparency, for more reporting, so that people can, can deal with issues that may arise from public services um, in, a, in a more straightforward manner. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so for, for almost every single item in that, in that matrix, there is a requirement for a uh, customer awareness and satisfaction survey. Um, which, which, is, which is great, right? Presumably this is something that's designed to ensure accountability. Um, but the one municipal service area that isn't required to have a customer satisfaction survey is this department, is um, Santa Clara Building and Planning. Um, that's the only one on the list that has no requirements for any, uh, any, mat uh, any metrics and no requirement for a customer satisfaction survey. So that, that kind of stood out to me as to, you know, we're requiring these things of everyone else, including other Santa Clara County departments, but not looking inward and requiring the same thing for this department. So through the chair, the county does provide an annual report on Stanford uh, every year. That's um, going to be the responsiveness of the projects that the county processes with Stanford throughout those years. Stanford is one entity, and we process their development applications. Uh, they're a client uh, or an applicant to the county. But why is there no light item for a customer satisfaction survey? So if it, there, there would be one customer, it would be Stanford, and the County Department of Planning and Development does have surveys available for all applicants where they can respond. It would be all applicants across the county responding to any surveys that we have available from a customer service perspective. Okay, so in this case, the county is the municipal service provider Stanford, the university is the sole customer. Correct. And they have a means of providing that information. Is it transparent? Yes, all, okay. all records are public. Um, the Stanford as a client, or as a, I keep saying client, but as an applicant, 
They have access to their district board aid. They have access to myself and the director, and they have access to any comments or concerns that they have, and we have um, consistent communications with them and standing meetings every month, every week, and throughout the year. Sorry, what I meant, what I, what I meant is, is that available to the general public? If there was a public records inquiry on any um, survey information, yes. It, any, any information that it goes back and forth between Stanford and the county, as long as there isn't a confidentiality um, component that's legally based, is available to the public. Okay. All records of the county are available to the public sure. across sure. all applicants and any communications. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. That's all I, that's all I had. Any other questions from the commission? We are only on the first chapter. <laughs> All right, so why don't we continue? I'm just bringing back up the slide. Okay, so we will now begin with chapter two, land use. Regarding lands outside of the academic growth boundary, Stanford has requ requested greater clarification regarding permitted uses in lands outside the AGB, the academic growth boundary. The proposed revisions to the discussion on this topic and the uses listed in SCPLU 22 provide greater transparency on what uses are allowed by aligning the language with the language in the county zoning ordinance. At the December 2022 board meeting, Supervisor Simidian included a directive that de the, department, uh, the department outreach to the Palo Alto Unified School District regarding potential school site location issues, including traffic and safety concerns. In response to those concerns, the SCP update identified the location of the potential future public school site as in the West Campus Development District, not including any portion of the Stanford Golf Course, Revisions to the SCP update presented today include updating figure 2.3 on development districts to identify the area of the Stanford golf course for clarity on this location. We will now pause for questions by the commission. Commissioner Rouser. Yeah, most of you already know what I'm gonna say. Um, the 99 year, it, it certainly feels good. And does it, is it still the position that a simple majority vote could change the uh, threshold from four to just a simple majority. There were, the last time we talked, there was some discussion of trying to work around that to make it more permanent, but is that still the case? I, it's kind of, it's, it's a strange situation. The question is whether the board could amend the general plan to delete the four-fifths vote by just a majority um, vote versus directly changing the AGB. Um, and I think you're correct that, yeah, on Thank that. You. A simple workaround. Uh, so, Commissioner so, did, you, did you have a question? Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and again, I think um, this might come up when uh, Stanford, I'm assuming Stanford will be given an opportunity to speak. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll have Stanford have an opportunity to speak as well as the public at the end. Okay, yeah, because I, I mostly wanted to address their um, comments that they submitted, so I can do that uh, later on. Yeah, we can do, we can do that at the, at the end. Okay. You can continue, chapter three. Moving on to chapter three for housing. I have two slides on this topic. In the housing chapter, a re revision was made to reflect a request by Supervisor Lee from the December 2022 board meeting. That included a paragraph discussing the imbalance between jobs and housing in the Mid-Peninsula subregion and updates to the related data to reflect current conditions. Additionally, the department also provided revisions to clarify the county's concerns regarding the reduction in housing opportunities for residents of nearby communities. As Stanford continues to pursue off-campus housing solutions that remove new or existing housing units from the local market. 
The proposed revisions to the housing chapter continue with the removal of references to the GSE Summer Affordability Survey. This is a document that is not available as a formal document for the public. In its place, references are made to the key characteristics of the Graduate Student Housing Affordability Study, such as food insecurity, housing affordability, child care, and other costs of living. Relative to permit streamlining, as requested by Supervisor Simidian at the December 13th, 2022 board meeting and included in the board's motion, the department continues to work towards ensuring transparency and the ability for the public to provide input relating to the expansion of streamlined permit processing throughout the SCP area. At this time, the SCP updates only apply permit streamlining efforts towards sites identified in the housing element as opportunity sites or sites otherwise eligible by state law, such as those within one half mile of a public transit station or high capacity transit stop. The department is preparing objective design standards for consideration by the board and within this process will also include public outreach, which will commence this year in anticipation that the objective design standards will be complete in 2024. As a note, the SCP update includes SCPHI 12, which encourages the county to consider more extensive utilization of on-campus permit streamlining after implementing and processing streamlined project identified as housing opportunity sites. The, in the intent of this phased extension of permit streamlining efforts is to ensure that the county has an opportunity to assess the success and challenges of that process, especially as experienced by the public prior to extending the program to the full SCP area. We will now pause for questions by the commission. Do we have any questions on the housing component? I, I guess we'll wait to the end to uh, discuss the 80% versus 100%. <laughs> we'll now begin with the circulation chapter. I have two slides on this topic. Proposed revisions to the circulation chapter include revisions to the parking discussion Clarify the assertion that on-campus housing residents do not require commute-related parking. Additionally, the proposed revisions provide clarification on current TDM programs and services within Stanford to reflect the current service provided by the Marguerite shuttle system, the transition from Stanford's physical transporta transportation store to online services, and the availability of transit passes. Additionally, the circulation chapter responds to neighborhood, and neighborhood concerns and direction from Supervisor Simidian about increased traffic in the College Terrace neighborhood. Traffic congestion is also identified as a major concern in the SEP and underlines the Stanford uh, underlies the Stanford Traffic Monitoring Program, which includes extensive data collection efforts, including cordon counts, parking counts, parking ratios, cut through traffic percentages and trip credits that have been recorded on an annual basis since 2001. The department is considering a policy that would provide neighborhood residents an opportunity to review an application for development at all opportunity sites prior to its submittal to the county. This would provide neighbors with an early opportunity to provide feedback on any preferred traffic reduction strategies and identify specific areas of concern. Additionally, requiring Stanford to share information with community members in advance of an application submittal would provide for greater communication, especially if such an application is eligible by the state for permit streamlining. We will now pause for any questions by the commission. I see no lights, I will ask a question. Well, I was very happy to see the reverse commutes put in it to the extent that they were. That was something that we requested last time around. Um, I was wondering if there's a policy in there to accommodate or encourage electrical, electric vehicles for charging stations by facilitating the implementation of charging stations. I need to re research that one for a minute. Okay. And then I have one more that I was sort of wondering about. We talk about the internal circulation system, but I was wondering uh, how we addressed the interface for pedestrians and bicycles to the surrounding areas. 
and whether that's uh, thoroughly accommodated as well. Can you please repeat the question? On the second one? Yes. The second one is, you know, there's a lot of discussion on internal circulation patterns, but I'm wondering about the interface to the surrounding areas, whether there's the ingress and egress where needed for pedestrian bicycle access to the surrounding community, you know, safe access. Yes, the, the circulation element does include uh, policies around providing convenient access given the size of the campus and the nature of the way Palo Alto and Menlo Park surrounded on three sides to have convenient access points uh, to re reduce vehicle trips and provide convenient access for people walking in and biking in or out. And, and those are independent of the automobile access? Correct. Okay. Some, some, not all. So, of course, some, yeah. And through the chair, uh, we do have Stanford representatives here. They do take a, um, a consistent and ongoing look at all of the traffic patterns and different modes of mobility. Um, we can ask them as well when they come up and talk. Okay, great. Uh, any, any other questions from the commission? All right, onward. And your first question, if I may, to the chair. We do have a program to in, that provides, in, or it says consider a program that would provide incentives for the increasing use of electric, hydrogen, or other zero emission vehicles towards meeting the transportation performance standards. Okay, yeah, so for something a little clearer that was specific to, you know, a program for charging stations throughout the campus to promote uh, electrical vehicles. I know Stanford's gonna do it anyway as a matter of course, but it's nice to put it in there. The next chapter we will cover is chapter five, open space. I have one slide for this topic. SCP-07 and SCP-08 of the open space chapter help to address the minimization of impacts from recreational activities and public access on academic facilities and environmental resources that are located in the open space areas of the campus. Proposed revisions to these policies address academic uses rather than academic facilities. This is to align the intent of the policies with the extended protections of an allowable use, recognizing that those uses may extend beyond a particular structure or facility. We will now pause for questions. Any questions? Once, going twice. And Commissioner just, Yeah, just real quick on the, on the uses, they had like additional uses like composting and then there was one other one that was like lumber or something, can you just kind of explain on what is sort of allowed to be used? There was, there was a list, I don't have it right in front of me, but. Um. Can you look at OS7 and OS8? Is this specific to policies OS7 and OS8? I believe those were more geared towards interfering with um, existing activities and uses on campus. But it sounds like you're asking for a definitive list of uses that may have been identified or defined. Yeah, out in the. I'm assuming it's outside the growth area, but um, I'll, I'll look. Just keep on going, and I'll look where it was at. Okay. Uh, uh, it could have been chapter two. Yeah, can Commissioner Rouser, uh, you know. His comment stimulates a comment that I had for the land use chapter, which I'm sorry, apologize for going back a little bit. Uh, but on LU5, I was confused by the reference to uses such as fences. Uh, so, and uh, there was, you know, very specific, but I was wondering if things like recreational elements, like picnic benches and so forth, would also be considered other uses. So it was, I was a little confused on the scope of, that, of, of what another use is within LU5. I apologize for stepping back, but the prerogative of the is, chair. Is there a way is to bring that up <laughs> on the, so we can all look at it? Oh, through, through the chair, uh, Commissioner Levy, is your question in relation to the field and research areas of Yeah, zoning? I was just confused by the, the, the concept. I'll have to go back to LU5 and look at my notes, but. If it is in relation to um, OSF, the, which is a, um, 
a zoning designation, the department is reflecting consistently with the approved GUP language as well as the SCP. We're not proposing changes, and I, I believe the, the zoning ordinance as well. So we're mimicking what our zoning ordinance is and not expanding upon that, if that's what your question yeah, is. Yeah, well, around. the basis of my question is that there was some confusion on what the term meant, and so it was really a request for clarification on the term so that we understood specifically what LU5 actually meant. And is it in the, in the second sentence, such as fences or golf courses, access, golf such course such access? Such as which are not for the purpose of occupancy, such as da da da, da must be permitted. Um, but yeah, I'm just, fences, it's, it's uh, so nebulous as, as far as what the size, you know, what the threshold is for what one of those uses would be. Right, the, the, that's coming strictly from our zoning ordinance. Um, but, you know, I, I agree there's some, there's a level of need for clarification there. That would be a separate process at the county through a zoning ordinance amendment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. I believe we um, also found the language that Commissioner Rouser was mentioning relative to, um, was it wood chipping and composting? So I'm going to scroll down because that's in the same chapter. It's LU22. So these are allowable land uses within the open space and field research designation. And I think this maybe was the, I, the line that you were mentioning. Yeah. Um, up above it had more of a brief description of it, so that led me to make a comment on it. But then I saw the more detailed in, in the bullet listing, and I was still kind of wondering about composting and wood recycling facilities it, you know I'm just picturing in my mind the open space by 280 or whatever how you know how does that how are those types of things going to be allowed in in that area or are we talking about apples and oranges here if I may through the, through the chair respond to Commissioner Rouser um, Jeff Bradley M group I think the important thing to keep in mind here is the the open space open space designation allows low intensity agriculture as sort of like the basic allowed use. And what we tried to do with this update to this list of allowed uses uh, within the land use designation that corresponds to the zoning designation is to make them essentially identical to avoid any going forward confusion about what's allowed in the in the open space area other than low intensity agriculture you get all it you get into all these other um, uses but if you think of agriculture and all the various activities that could take place under that composting and wood recycling is clearly consistent you know generally with with that type of activity um, and what's what I think is more unique about this situation is, sorry, losing my voice, <clears throat> is it also allows for uh, limited research, uh, which is important because of Stanford's a university, obviously, and this large area of land does provide important function in addition to the open space, in addition to the agriculture and habitat protection, but providing area for actual outdoor uh, research on, on, you know, on natural subjects. And so that's a big component of the zoning ordinance uh, specifications that we tried to bring into the community plan to avoid any disconnect between the, the two documents on uh, what can be a fairly technical distinctions between different uses. We didn't want the, the two documents to be fighting each other. So like Z-Best does composting so they could have an operation like that in the open space area of Stanford or is this no, no. ZBest would be a, a large scale commercial composting facility, you know, serving the whole county and beyond. Um, this, this would be composting uh, 
clearly incidental to the, to the main use of open space and low intensity agriculture. Could not be a commercial operation where, with a pay for, you know, pay for services with truckload after truckload coming in. Uh, and, and the wording supports that interpretation. That, that's, that, that, that's basically my comment is <laughs> how, how do we how do you keep, keep it, keep it <laughs> like you're describing it. Jeff, there's a square footage restriction on um, development in, in this zone, and it's really low. And so you could never do a, a facility like ZBEST and comply with that square footage limitation. It's, it's really, it's, is it 15,000? 15, yeah, 15,000 square feet. Um, and some of that's probably already been gobbled up, so it's, it's pretty restrictive. Are you good with that, Commissioner Rausner? That works for you? Okay, so I'm going to move forward to chapter six. Just one moment. So chapter six is resource conservation. I have one slide on this topic. Proposed updates to the resource conservation chapter are minimal and include revisions that reflect input from the department and the university technical specialists related to habitat and biodiversity discussion from Stanford's habitat conservation plan. Furthermore, figure 6.4 on the age of existing structures and figure 6.5 on listed resources have also been replaced and updated with versions that improve legibility with focus on the developed area of the SEP rather than the full extent of Stanford lands. We will now pause for any questions by the commission. I think we're good. Moving on to chapter seven, health and safety. I have a few slides on this. The health and safety chapter includes proposed revisions by the department on language related to suicide reduction and prevention, as well as updates to the discussion on renewable energy resources with updated information from Stanford. On the topic of health and safety reporting policies, implementation measures SCPHSI 27 and SCPHSI 30 include requirements that Stanford provide additional information on an annual basis regarding law enforcement and mental and behavioral health services. As requested by Supervisor Simidian and included in the motion from the December 13, 2022 board meeting, the department continues to coordinate with Stanford to ensure public availability of data relating to these policies. The commission should be aware that the department has not recommended changes to these implementation measures at this time. However, pending further discussion with the university regarding the reporting requirements for municipal services as we discussed in chapter two or chapter one, recommendations may be forthcoming. We will now pause for any questions by the commission. I see none at this point. You can continue. So that was the last slide for the chapter changes. The next uh, slide will discuss the update on coordination with other jurisdictions. On this topic, on this topic, at the direction of Supervisor Simidian, the department continues the effort to coordinate with the City of Palo Alto to address the 1985 Land Use Policy Agreement with the Board of Supervisors. The department also prepared a letter providing the County of San Mateo an explanation for the methodology used to conduct an analysis of the total property tax exemption provided to Stanford within a given jurisdiction. The department continues to be available for any further coordination and information sharing as requested by the county. And through the chair, just a point of clarification, we're in the process of preparing the letter to San Mateo County. The staff report also provides an update on coordination efforts with other jurisdictions. In addition to ongoing coordination with the city of Palo Alto and the county of San Mateo, the department will facilitate a multi-jurisdictional meeting in the summer and fall of 2023 to update other jurisdictions of any potential revisions to the SCP update prior to pursuing its adoption. 
The department has also participated in the June 8th, 2023 Stanford Community Resource Group meeting and received feedback from members on various topics related to a housing affordability analysis to consider affordability challenges faced by Stanford affiliates in other jurisdictions. Extension of the scope of SCPHI 17 to conduct surveys of postdoctoral students, other workers, and graduate students. Revert, and finally, to revert changes to suicide reduction back to suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. The draft EIR for the project was released on June 12, 2023, with the public comment period closing after 45 days on July 24, 2023, at 5 p.m. After today's study session scheduled, uh, after today's study session, session, we will further refine the chapters and then proceed with the final review and consideration process for the SCP updates with the anticipation of board consideration for adoption in fall or winter of 2023. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your questions and comments. Our team is available for any further questions. First of all, I want to say you've done an outstanding job. You can tell by the limited number of uh, issues that Stanford has and that we have not been inundated by emails from other jurisdictions. Uh, so you must be covering your bases very well. So congratulations on a job well done. Um, at this point in time, I will ask, first of all, why don't we ask if there's any, anybody from the public that would like to speak. Um, for starting with Stanford, uh, Stanford, you'd have 10 minutes to speak if so desired. You don't need to use it all, but you're welcome to. You're welcome to. Well, first off, since I have 10 minutes, I wanted to say it's so nice to see you all in person. It's great to be here. We appreciate um, all of your input so far. It's been very helpful for us to hear from you, your perspectives, and your questions. We didn't intend to make any statement today. It is your study session. We did submit a letter with some of our feedback um, that we also shared with Hewlett. And um, other than that, we have a team that's listening deeply to what you have to say. Um, I am happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. I know that there were a few comments um, where you were seeking maybe some input from the university, and I'd be happy to try to answer those if you'd like me to take that moment. If it's Commissioners, do you have any questions for? Representative here? We should ask about, about the circulation, but we can also ask about the 100% uh, the re that request for having 100% of the housing being on site versus the Stanford request to have 80% of the housing on site. Do you have other specific reasons why you don't, you'd like to have that policy altered? Uh, several, yes. We would like to have the flexibility to utilize properties that we own outside of our campus that are aligned with our planning principles, which are essentially looking at transportation corridors and transit centers that we can maximize using or building housing. So a good example is Middlefield Plaza, which is a new project. It's a 215 unit project in Menlo Park. That's um, a project that's already completed, but something along those lines, we have property along El Camino Real and other communities that we could utilize, um, Redwood City as well. So we would just like to have the opportunity to have the flexibility to look at other areas that um, could support housing in a more meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And you think 80% uh, is a reasonable number, not 90%. Uh, you like you think that having the flexibility to have 20% of the housing off campus is reasonable? If I understand you correctly, how, and I'm sorry if I missed this in the conversation before, but the policy that's written is 70-30. So it's 70% on campus and 30% in Palo Alto. And what we're asking is to expand the Palo Alto 30% to other areas outside of just Okay, Alto. great. Uh, then the uh, other item that uh, Commissioner Belska brought up as well was the reporting component of it and how the current, according to Stanford, this is a little onerous, what's being requested. Are there specifics in there that you think could be reduced? Uh, it's not sort of a one size fit all. Maybe some things require a biannual uh, review and some an annual review. Uh, have, do you have a proposal that you think is more reasonable uh, reporting? 
Yes, and we actually have shared that with county staff. Um, they've been terrific. We've been having conversations with them. We have a whole list, um, as Commissioner Belska pointed out, there's 27. I always thought there was 26, but thank you. There's 27 um, items, and we did a thorough review with our subject matter experts across campus to get a better understanding of what's possible and what's not, and we've shared that information. So. Okay, and so this discussion is ongoing with staff, and so? Correct. Okay, great, as long as we keep it ongoing <laughs> to come up with a reasonable reporting that everybody agrees with. Uh, is the Commissioner Belska, did you have a question? Uh, I, I do, and actually, um, on the same topic that, that you, your first topic, the, the housing split, um, yeah, I just wanted to get a little more context and a little more understanding um, why, well, and, and I guess the question is more for the department, but, but I'd like Stanford to be able to participate in the conversation, which is why I waited until now to bring this up. Um, I guess I want to understand um, why those restrictions are being put in place, um, because it does, it does seem to make sense that if Stanford owns land, why shouldn't they be able to build housing on it? Um, so again, I'm a little new, so I apologize if, if this has all been you know, covered before, but, but I was just curious what, what those restrictions, what, why those restrictions were being put in place. Sure, I can go ahead and assist um, through the chair, Lisa McKyle. There's been um, clear direction through the board to make sure that there's, you know, uh, availability of full mitigation of housing versus academic um, square footage. So at the direction of the board, the department has looked closely at uh, making sure that adequate housing, that there's nexus between housing and academic growth, and that it's provided in very close proximity to the campus, and so 70% uh, on campus is where the county has landed. But housing is housing. I mean, it's it's beneficial wherever you put it. Um, so why why wouldn't we be allowing Stanford to build it elsewhere? Sure. If M, through M Group, if Jeff, you would like to go ahead and supplement. And through the chair, Jeff, if you would clarify for Mrs. Belska how it works relative to Stanford's campus and their GUP, if you would clarify that. She doesn't have the benefit of having any background on this process. Sure, thank you for that opportunity. Um, Commissioner Bel Bel Belska raises a, a good question about what, what are the fundamental principles behind this idea. And I, you have to take a step back and go back to the 1985 land use agreement that we, re we, we got some discussion earlier, but we didn't really get into it that much in terms of questions and answers. But from a, a real fundamental perspective, the, that tri-party agreement, as it's also called, allows for Stanford as an unincorporated area within the county to develop at, at urban levels, which is an exception to the normal LAFCO county policies around open space and development issues. So in exchange for a, a long history of urban development within that 1,200, call it 1,200 acres within the campus core, within the academic growth boundary, there, there's a, a commitment to not only require municipal services, that Stanford provide its own services for that unincorporated area to support that level of urban development, but, and that any, any non-academic uses, such as the research park, the hospital, Stanford Shopping Center, those also are addressed within the three-party agreement as being appropriate to be annexed into the city of, of Palo Alto. And the, the three-party agreement laid out that academic uses, academic support uses, and academic, or, or just housing, in support of all that, could be provided on campus. And the, the department's position, uh, consistent with the board direction that, that Lisa mentioned, is that any housing uh, provided by Stanford off campus is essentially removing that housing from the general stock of housing available to the public. Stanford housing, by definition, unless it's specifically labeled community housing, is designated for what's known as Stanford affiliates, faculty, staff, undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, and other workers. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a closed system. And the county has also done the background work to show 
that over the next 50, 80, 100 years, there's enough land there to support the growth of the campus at levels of two, th nearly three times its existing size. So there's, there's the ability to have that type of development contained within that planning area. However, given the, the track record of Stanford also being able to provide housing off campus, but very close to campus on existing, what we call original Stanford land grant lands, think again of the campus plus these other areas like the shopping center, the research park. Um, there, there's been significant housing uh, built within those areas as well. And those housing at that location functionally serves the same uh, needs as, as housing officially on the campus core in terms of having people close to where they're working and living. So sorry for the long answer, but it, there's been a, a long history of developing this policy uh, going back to 2018. And through the chair, I'll just add one more supplement to uh, Jeff's response. And it, you know, when, when Stanford takes uh, an apartment building that's in, I'm, I'm just making this up, another city or another jurisdiction that was available to the general public, it then takes that housing away from the general public and focuses it, focuses it towards um, the, the Stanford community. And in, in that sense, it also takes it off of the tax roll. So there's, there's a complex set of issues around um, why there's a desire to ensure that housing is placed on, on site and in, on, on the campus. Okay, thank you. Um, can, I, can I hear more from Stanford on this topic? Sure, sure. I would say overall flexibility is our goal here. Um, can you hear me okay? <laughs> I would say overall flexibility is our goal and, and having as much flexibility as possible. Um, as you mentioned in your comment, housing is housing. And um, just to clarify a few things, for example, if we do buy an existing structure that has units in it and we uh, put our students in that or our faculty in that, we are taking that population out of the rest of the community in terms of competing for space. Um, it's not necessarily our goal to, to use that as a tool moving forward. We would really like to look at how we can add additional units, like the Middlefield Project. We have a project right now in Portola Valley for 37 units. So we're really trying to look at ways we can add additional housing so we don't have the conversation where people are, are um, feeling like we're taking housing out of the residential stock of the communities around us. So for us, the priority is looking at how can we add new housing stock. So we look at our existing land assets as an opportunity to do that. I would say also the reason why we ask for flexibility is housing our students on campus and our graduate students and our postdocs and our faculty on campus makes a whole lot of sense and we've been doing a great job doing that. We house 100% of our undergraduates on our campus for all four years. We house 75% of our graduate students and we hope to increase that number in the near future. Um, we have quite a few housing um, opportunities for our faculty on campus. We have over 860 housing units in the San Juan neighborhood um, and other, community, uh, other neighborhoods around our campus. So we feel we do an outstanding job right now of addressing the housing needs that we have. Now thinking about any future growth that we have and how we want to accomplish that housing, Again, the flexibility is key for us so that we can look at what our housing assets are and take advantage of that. We've done multiple surveys uh, with our community and not all staff want to live on campus. <laughs> not all staff want to live in Palo Alto. So we have a variety of different needs that we need to address and having as much flexibility to do that and provide the housing is really what we are hoping to achieve. Okay, thank you. I, I certainly understand both perspectives here. Um, I, I, I guess just my feeling is, given the housing crisis, putting restrictions on housing seems counterintuitive. Um, would would county be um, amendable to to maybe allowing Stanford more flexi flexibility, but maybe requiring any off-campus housing to have a certain percentage? of units allocated towards the community, um, especially in the case of new housing is being developed by Stanford, right? You have a willing 
you know, willing developer to build housing if they were to allocate some proportion of that housing towards community versus uh, Stanford only, would that, would that make the county more well, let's, con let's continue this discussion after the public testimony. Okay. Okay, with staff. Uh, the Commissioner, Commissioner Moore, did you have a question? Yeah, just um, on the letter that was submitted, um, there was just a reiteration of the concern about the 99-year academic growth boundary, and and um, and of course nobody knows what what lies in the future. But um, but given the sustainability um, report that again was just referred to about pretty much being able to accommodate a massive increase in, in um, development, both you know housing as well as academic use on the core campus. It, it, it makes a, I think there's a strong argument to say that it, it's highly unlikely that any t significant development would need to take place outside of that, given that that study it made it very, very clear. So I just want to know what your thoughts are um, about that, you know, because the it's it's not that it's it's going to re, um, restrain uh, potential future growth on the core campus. I don't know if I'm going to do a good job answering your question, Commissioner Moore, because it is multi-layered and complex. I think. I think in general, what we're asking for is to have a planning horizon that's very indicative of best practices in planning in general. Um, 25 years tends to be um, typically what a planning document, um, the, the life of a planning document before you revisit it. So that's a simple answer to your complicated question. Beyond that, the university is doing a lot of work at looking at our climate action plan right now, and we have some very um, uh, ambitious goals of net zero by 2050 and, and a variety of other things. So we're really looking from an academic perspective and at also an operational perspective on how we are impacting the climate and how best to reduce that um, impact, right? And so with that, there are planning practices. We haven't completed that effort yet, so we don't quite understand what that looks like and what that means. So I know that doesn't necessarily answer your question, but it's a layer to part of that at the sustainability study that we had done in the past, right? Mm -hmm. The other piece of that is starting to take a look at what this housing requirement of putting 100% of our housing or 70% or however you want to look at it on our campus, what is that doing to that growth, right? Because that's square footage that wasn't accommodated for when we did the SDSS. Um, so really trying to understand what that looks like. Then we also have a whole different effort where we're starting to look at resiliency and adaptive land use and climate readiness. So really understanding how a variety of different climate changes are impacting our campus and how can we be climate ready. So what does that mean, right? So again, it's probably not a very clear answer for you, but there are a variety of things that we look at when we um, want to better understand how we can best utilize our land in the AGB and if, when, there will ever be a need for us to look at going beyond the AGB. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? You still have a few minutes if you want to say anything. <laughs> no, just thank you. Have, have okay. a good night. Um, just real quick, I'm not sure which section is, but the, there was a, a survey done, I think, with the graduate students, and I know when they came, I, I was a little concerned with the, the sample of, of people that actually responded, and yet here we sort of just dive into the results of that, and there's no real authority behind that to say how strong is the data that we're basing all of these assumptions are, so that's just a general come. I don't know if... Stanford provided that survey or if that was done with an outside agency or whatever on it, but it, it, it seemed like, and, and I know I get asked to do so many surveys from agencies, from businesses, from whatever, and it, there, there comes a point, I'll let you know if I didn't like something, otherwise <laughs> let's move on kind of thing. So um, th there's sort of a satisfaction rate that, that may be embedded that never got transferred into the results of the survey. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, I don't know if that's a question for Stanford or, or uh, for Jeff on 
that it, it would be nice within the document to give a little more authority in, into that survey result to say this is super reliable, we got 100% participation, or we're, we're some of the statistics that we're kind of saying here's a sample size we're projecting out, and if that's a smaller sample size, then at least kind of note that. Indicate that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Right. Thank you, Commissioner Rouser. Any other comments here? Uh, Peggy, is there anybody online who would like to speak? We have no live or virtual speakers. We have no speakers. Zippo. Right. And we'll close public testimony. And uh, Commissioner Velsko, you want to start where you left off? Remember. <laughs> yeah, do I remember where I left off? Um, no, so, so I, guess, I guess just a question for, for the county, right? Is, is there some compromise, right, that could be, that could be achieved? Sure, I'll, I'll start. I have, a, I have a little piece of information or oh. comment on that as well. And that is one possible compromise is that all new development off site there would have, to, or all development, off, all housing off site would have to be new development in order to be considered. As you were talking about them taking over an apartment building, which would, you know, remove housing from the stock. But if all, if it was only considered new housing was considered, uh, would that be a potential compromise? So through the chair, I'll start, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to um, Jeff Bradley. Can I, can I just interrupt for a second? Oh, sure. There's also the inclusionary housing requirement on it, and Stanford has a much bigger piece of that that, that they have to contribute towards. So how does that, is that on campus, off campus, all the same? And is that not also providing additional housing? Sure. I'll go ahead and start, and then I'll hand it over to um, Jeff Bradley. Uh, you know, I think it's important to note that for other lands that are outside of the county's jurisdiction, that you know, the, the county's not stopping Stanford from developing housing in those other jurisdictions. This document cannot do that. This document is governed under our jurisdiction, and for unincorporated areas, including Stanford campus, when it comes to um, the desire of the county to ensure that adequate housing is being provided. It's in relationship to our jurisdiction of academic space, which is the Stanford campus. So as Stanford campus grows and more academic uses are expanded, there's a desire to make sure that the housing, the nexus of that housing and that uh, related to that academic space is in clo excuse me, close proximity to the uses. And so that's been the push and the desire of, of the county. Now, there are other variables related, and there's other jurisdictions and communities who have grown to become concerned about the housing being either taken over or developed new in these other jurisdictions um, because it takes it out of the tax basis for those jurisdictions. So there's a multiplicity of concerns. But bringing it back to the county's response and the county's responsibility, it's related to the growth on the academic campus that uh, the county is in charge of. And so with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Jeff Bradley to see if he wants to supplement anything that I'm saying. Oh, let me just add one more. Um, the, the Stanford campus is required to provide housing um, in response to the county's inclusionary housing. And that, again, is on unincorporated lands. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, so I'm going to approach the question as, as from the angle of um, why, is the, why is the county requiring, through this policy document, to provide all the housing on or near campus? Um, and I think it's important when we talk about all, all, it's really all new housing generated from new academic facilities. So we're not talking about asking all the existing Stanford faculty and staff to move from Pleasanton or San Jose or San Francisco to, to the campus. Based on Stanford data, it's probably a few, it's a few years old now, but essentially, Less than 10% of the of the Stanford affiliates actually live on campus, and over over 90% live off campus. So even an even an aggressive policy that requires all new housing coming from new development 
demand coming from new development to require to be required to be on or near campus is not going to move the needle that dramatically. There will still be a wide variety of housing choice uh, for Stanford affiliates. Stanford has done a great job, obviously, as we heard, housing 100% of their undergraduates and a very high percentage of their graduate students with the recent construction of the, of the Escondido Village uh, graduate student residences project. So they, there's a really good news story there uh, for Stanford to tell around student housing. But when it comes to staff and faculty and other worker housing, and when we, when we focus on new, a new development that would come in conceivably under a new general use permit, um, that housing, um, there's a really strong policy push that really makes sense from a regional perspective given the acute housing crisis that's basically centered in, in Palo Alto for all effects and purposes within, within our area. Um, and to not feed into that by, by putting, by essentially exporting the needed housing into the surrounding communities. That's been done over the last 100 years. And Palo Alto and Menlo Park and Mountain View have received a lot of that. There are also a lot of uh, great Stanford programs that provide uh, down payment assistance, um, creative financing strategies with, with third parties to provide uh, uh, equity uh, uh, trading for down payment assistance, um, straight out cash grants for down payment assistance for, for Stanford folks within a, a specified radius from the campus. That, that probably won't, won't go away. Those, those programs are there. Um, they, they serve, they serve the, the campus well, uh, but it does have the net effect of, of pushing housing out throughout the region where there's really an opportunity to, to focus it right into where the, where the demand is being created. And that's really the, the bedrock underlying the, the, the county's uh, housing policy on this matter. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any additional comments? Any more comments on the plan? Do we uh, have a motion to accept the report? Accept the plan as, and do we have any, uh, you know, any, any, anything that you'd like to put on a motion as far as conditions or recommendations and comments? To the chair, this is a receive report. There's no motion required. No motion required. No. Okay, not to accept the report. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And our next item on the agenda is the election of officers. And uh, we'll so why don't we start with the chair and then moved on to the vice chair. And so I'll take a motion for a nomination for a chair. I can, uh, I'd like to nominate Commissioner Donahue for the chairperson for the next year. And do we have a second? I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any, other, any other discussion, any other nominees? Do you accept the nomination? I was told there'd be a certain amount of a hand holding, so I accept the nomination. All right. Okay, we have a motion to second, and we have an acceptance, but I'm not sure we even need to vote because we only have uh, one candidate here. Uh, a roll call vote is After required. A roll call vote then to accept them. We have a motion and a second. Commissioner Belska for the vote. Approve. Commissioner Rouser. Approve. Commissioner Moore. Commissioner Escobar? Approve. Vice Chairperson O'Donohue? Yes. Chairperson Levy? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. All right. Apologies, your mic is not on. Yes, Commissioner Moore? Oh, okay. Um, I would like to nominate. Mark Rouser is vice chair, if he is interested. I'll second. 
Commissioner Rausser, would you like? I was going to nominate Commissioner Belska. <laughs> well, you can always decline it and make to nominate Commissioner Belska. I, I will decline it. Thank you, though. And did you want to make a motion? I'll make a motion that Commissioner Belska. Uh, apologies, I believe there was a second on the motion, so we need to take a vote on oh, that. Or, or, or we can pull the motion, or the person who made Unless the motion. Unless the motion is withdrawn. I'll withdraw the motion. Okay. Now, okay, we have a motion for Commissioner Belska. Do we have a second? Okay. You <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll second it. Okay. And then Commissioner Belska, do you accept the nomination? Uh, again, on the hand-holding terms, but yes, I accept. Okay, great. Uh, then we uh, have a roll call. Any, any discussion on the motion? We have a roll call vote. Commissioner Belska. Yes. Commissioner Rouser. I approve. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Escobar. Yes. Vice Chairperson O'Donohue? Yes. Chairperson Levy? Aye. Motion passes 6-0. Right. Should I hand the rest of the uh, meeting over to our new chair? Yes. <laughs> you. There's, not, there's not much there. <laughs> to, the, to Commissioner Levy, <laughs> once the motion passes, um, Commissioner O'Donohue is officially chair, but you can um, ask, uh, hit, you can continue on as long as everybody knows what you're doing. <laughs> Commissioner Donahue, would you like to take the chair? I'll take it at the next meeting. All right. Okay. Well, then let me ask no, number eight. Well, number eight is receive report from the chairperson. Mr. Chairperson, do you have anything to report? I have no report. <laughs> Neither does the past chair. Uh, can, uh, receive reports from other commissioners. All right. Uh, then let's see, uh, receive report from San Martin Planning Advisory Committee. I understand there was no meeting this month. Correct. So we have, don't have a report, otherwise we probably would have taken it out of order. Um, council? Yeah, just a brief um, note that we, I don't know if you had been informed, but the county was sued by an, an organization for not adopting its housing element on time. And we have settled that lawsuit. Um, on pretty favorable terms, we agreed to a timeline for um, adopting our housing element and um, ag agreed to some other minor things, but it was a, a pretty innocuous settlement okay. that just recognizes our existing requirements under the law pretty much anyway. Okay, that, that's good. All right, uh, Planning Commission Secretary. I have nothing to report. Uh, Oh, let me correct myself. Um, I believe I will aim to have two trainings at the next planning commission meeting, uh, one from LAFCO, and I believe the other one is from Valley Water. Oh, great. Uh, question, have we had any builder's remedies come through as a result of being late on the planning commission, on the housing element? We do have one application. We have one application. Okay. That's a Burbank area? Or? No. Okay. That sounds like that's what I'm going to say. Uh, Receive report from the director, but there's a, hello, De director. Deputy director. Oh, deputy, oh, deputy director. Although I have nothing to report. <laughs> okay, now, hello, director. <laughs> she'll, she'll be up in one second. Thank you. So um, we have no report, but I do want to say, <laughs> um, relative to SIMPAC, um, I just wanted to let the chair and the commission know we canceled the meeting. And the reason we canceled the meeting is because there were no scheduled items for the SIMPAC to hear. Okay. Um, one thing we're trying to work on with SIMPAC is just to make sure they understand the scope of what is before them, even though they have requested to expand their scope. Um, we have to go through the right process 
and, um, in order for that to happen. So we just wanted the board to know what, what staff is working on. Um, that's really the only report that we have at this, well, no, let me back up. And then I'll add, um, we have been operating at a 25% vacancy rate. I had come to the Planning Commission and let the Commission know, and they were significant positions that we were vacant on. Uh, our Code Enforcement Program Manager position is still currently vacant, um, and uh, we just made an offer to, for our Deputy Director of Administration and the candidate has accepted. So we're diligently working to fill our positions so that we can, our hope is that by the end of the year, we will be maybe one or 2% vacant, but um, we have had a very challenging year operating with that level of vacancy. Um, and so I do wanna say, because I know um, Commissioner Rouser is very close to the San Martin community we are down to two code enforcement officers where we should be at seven. So I just want to let you know that as you're talking with the community and if, you're, um, if they're saying to you that we are not as responsive, they are right because we don't have the resources right now. Um, we're doing our best to recruit. We've had um, seven failed recruitments. We are not willing to just have people who can't function. We are trying to acquire people who can perform the jobs in excellence. And so it's a process that we must go through. So with that, um, that ends my report. Right. And, that, and that potentially results in some delays on the general plan updates and so forth? No. Our, um, what we're focusing on for our update right now is the housing element. We are not embarking on a comprehensive update on the general plan. I want to keep repeating that because I know the Planning Commission keeps wanting other elements to come. Once we get fully staffed, we will re reprioritize what we bring forward. Right. But a full comprehensive general plan update, we are not at, okay. um, Chair. So, so the answer is sort of yes, that you think that things are slowing down as far as movement on potential element, updates to elements. Um, I wouldn't say that they're slowing down because um, our vacancy rate in planning is not there. Um, I, although um, what we have three, only three positions vacant in planning, right? Three. Only three positions vacant in planning. The elements that we have to get processed are what we are working on. But um, every unit within the, planning, within the planning and development division, every unit had vacancy. Planning was one of the ones that we filled those positions quite quickly. So our administration, and the, one of our units we had um, full staff was our fiscal unit. Um, but development services, our building inspectors, but no. Planning did not slow down. <laughs> um, we were worried about that because we were concerned about burning out our staff, but it wasn't planning where the hit came. It's our administrative support, our IT support, and so planning has continued to move forward. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, I just had a question. If, are the vacancies uh, listed on the county website? No, they are not. We d don't normally list our vacancies on the county website. We, um, we had our org chart in our budget book, but we did not list our vacancies on the county website. So recruitment doesn't happen through the website? You're talking about a public website for the public yeah. to see? No, we work through our um, what's known as ESA. So if someone is interested in applying for a position, the County of Santa Clara has a job opportunity website that they can go on and look at all the positions that are available within this county. And okay, planning so is listed in that, but on the planning and development website, we don't list our vacancies. Okay, no, no, but they are listed somewhere online. For, of course, for, for okay. this county. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, okay thank website. you. Anything else from staff here? Director, Deputy Director, no? Okay, uh, announce, receive correspondence. Any uh, correspondence you want to, that we want to uh, have reported to us? Um, it's just a matter of you receiving the correspondence that was published with the agenda. Okay, of course we did. Consent calendar we have already done. Uh, so I, we move on to adjournment.
the next regular meeting is scheduled for Thursday, August 24th at 6 p.m. here in the same place. All right, Thank great. you. So uh, adjourned. I get to use my gavel for last time. <laughs> and here you go. <laughs> no.